Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Happy Easter. Start out with a, just a piece of trivia for you. It's a question you can ask your fellow Christian friends to stump them and see if they know the answer. Did you know that in Christian tradition, there is a follower of Jesus who's been given the title Apostle to the Apostles? Do you know who it is? It's quite a moniker, isn't it? I mean, if you think about the fact that there is somebody who's been given the role of taking the good news, of taking the risen Lord to the rest of the apostles, who that's their job to take it in the world in the first place, and take it in their life and to live it. The apostle to the apostles. But who is it? Okay, if your first thought is, I bet it's Peter. That's a really good guess. Because Peter... Jesus picked Peter for leadership amongst the apostles. It would make sense that Peter carried the title of the apostle of the apostles. He is the leader of disciples. But you can probably guess if I'm offering you Peter as an answer, it's not Peter. If you're thinking maybe it's John, that would be a good guess. John was the youngest of the disciples, so it's not naturally where you'd go in terms of guessing. But John is often referred to in the Gospel of John as the one whom Jesus loved. So what we know about John is that he and Jesus had some sort of special friendship. They were were kind of buddies at a level that he wasn't with the rest of the disciples. So it would make sense if you guessed John, that'd be a pretty good guess, that he might have turned to his closest, most intimate friend amongst the disciples and said, you be the apostle to the apostles. But it's not John. The apostle to the apostles as named by the church well over a thousand years ago, is Mary Magdalene. Lots of people are going, I knew that. I would have told you that if I didn't want to interrupt him. (laughs) And she rightly earned her title, the Apostles to the Apostles, 2,000 years ago this morning. Interestingly, on Good Friday of this week, I was going through the newspaper and I was reading the Washington Post. And in the Washington Post, there was an article that was exclusively about Mary Magdalene. And so I got interested by that and I started reading it. Mostly, the whole emphasis of the article was to say this. It was a lament. It was a lament that Christian ministers across our nation are going to stand up on Easter morning. They're going to step up into the pulpit. They're going to preach about the empty tomb. And they're going to say the empty tomb was found today by Mary Magdalene, who was a reformed and forgiven prostitute. Except that she wasn't a reformed or forgiven prostitute. Well, she might have been forgiven if she'd been a prostitute, but she wasn't a prostitute. That's not her story. Unfortunately, through much of Christian history, what's happened is Christianity, and this is about the 4th or 5th century that this began, Christianity began to combine the stories of two women who are both told in Scripture. One is Mary Magdalene, and the other person that gets, as we call, conflated, meaning combined into that story, is that the woman who comes to Jesus and anoints his feet with oil and dries his feet with her hair. And we actually don't know she was a prostitute. What we know is that the disciples don't think very highly of her and they tend to say that's a woman of not good reputation, Jesus. So the world has, first of all, taken her and immediately said, well, she's a prostitute. And then they've taken her and combined her with Mary Magdalene and said their stories are one, but they're actually two separate people. Mary Magdalene isn't that person. So let me tell you a little bit about this important woman who plays such a vital role in the very first Easter morning. First of all, Mary Magdalene is mentioned 12 times in Scripture, which in comparison to all of the disciples, is more than most of the disciples are ever mentioned in Scripture. 
Of the four gospel readings that tell the story of Easter morning and the empty tomb and the discovery of the resurrection, there is only one person who is common to all four stories across all four gospels who's there always, no matter who tells the story, and that is Mary Magdalene is always present in every story. She was a follower of Jesus. She was probably financially supportive of Jesus in his ministry. And what we know about her from the Gospel of Luke and from the Gospel of Mark is that she had seven demons that Jesus cast out of her. And she is our central character in our story this morning at the empty tomb. She and another woman who's known as the other Mary, which is really unfortunate historically to be known for the rest of eternity as the other Mary. She and the other Mary come to the tomb because Jesus was crucified on Friday and he died later in the afternoon and the sun was getting ready to go down and the Sabbath was going to start because it starts at sundown on Friday. So there was pressure to take care of the body and get him buried as quickly as possible, which meant they didn't have the amount of time that they would normally have to minister to his body, to attend to it in the way that they normally would. So on Easter morning, they woke up early and they came to the tomb in order to do the ministrations to Jesus' body that should have taken place before they placed him in the tomb. And in the most dramatic of all the Gospels, they approached the tomb and there is an angel descending before them. And as the angel begins to descend, there is thunder and there are earthquakes and the ground around them shakes and dramatically in front of them, the stone that is blocking the tomb rolls away. The angel says to them, come. He's not dead, he's alive. Come, look in the tomb, see for yourself, it's empty. Jesus is risen. And so the two Marys step forward and they do exactly that. They peer into the tomb and it's exactly as they said. The cloths are lying there, but there is no Jesus. And in that moment, they know it. They know that Jesus has risen from the dead. And they are filled with excitement to the point where they turn immediately and begin to sprint home down along the path the way they'd come. As they're running along the way, heading back home, they see up ahead someone on the path in front of them. And as they approach it, suddenly realizes to, they realize this is Jesus. He is alive. So they approach him and they throw themselves on their knees at his feet to worship him. And Jesus turns to them and the first word out of his mouth is greetings. Now that word might sound familiar to you. It's used another place in the New Testament. We can't help but see the parallel as we begin to look at it because it is an angel who visits Mary, the mother of Jesus, who says, Greetings, O favored one. Now Jesus turns to Mary Magdalene on the day that he's been resurrected, on the day that he's no longer in the tomb, on the day that he's come back to life, and he turns to Mary Magdalene, who's the first to discover this news, and he says, Greetings. Well, obviously, he's drawing greetings, O oh, favored one, because you are the first to discover the news that is going to change the world. So Jesus then turns to her and says, Go, go tell the disciples. And it's this commissioning of Mary. When he turns to Mary Magdalene and he says, go tell the disciples, it's that commissioning that has earned her her title, Apostle to the Apostles. Her job in that moment is to take the greatest news in the history of creation and to take it to the disciples. She is the first to encounter the risen Lord and she is commissioned to run, go tell the world. But here's the question for today. As we read this particular passage, this particular version, why Mary? 
of all the people in the world, of all the people who could have showed up at the tomb, of all the people who could have discovered that Jesus was resurrected, why Mary Magdalene? Why was she the one that God chose to be there present in that moment? Now, what's often said in terms of preaching and teaching is that people will say, well, it's because she was a former prostitute, and that made her the most lowly of all possible people, which made the symbolism of the lowliest person coming forward to discover it important. But the truth is that doesn't work because we know that's not even true. That's not who she was. Sometimes it's also said that, well, it was Mary because she was a woman. And as a woman, she had to deal with the lowly station of being a woman in first century Palestine. And that made her the right choice. Except here's the problem with that. That's perfectly okay, but that narrows down all the candidates to half of the population of Palestine. It doesn't tell us why Mary is the one who was chosen. I think the answer as to why it's Mary is to be found in her healing by Jesus. Mary was healed of seven demons by Jesus, and we can understand that any way we want to understand it. If you want to read the scripture and understand that this was probably some sort of significant mental illness that she was dealing with at the time, that's okay. If you want to understand it as more literally she was dealing with some sort of demonic possession, that's all right. Here's what I think is important to understand, that when they wrote the story, they said she was dealing with seven demons. That wasn't standard, it wasn't a normative number. I think it was a way that they were saying what she was dealing with was way beyond any kind of normal suffering. At the very least, Mary had been chronically inflicted with some sort of brokenness in her life that was horrible, life-inhibiting, and absolutely isolating her from the world and her community. And in the midst of that brokenness, in the midst of that isolation, in the midst of that pain, Jesus comes into her life and he heals her. Jesus gave her her life back. Amongst the 12 disciples, there is not one with a similar story to that. I'm convinced that Mary was chosen, not in spite of her past brokenness, but because of it. It was her past brokenness that made her the most likely in that moment when she was encountering Jesus to recognize the risen Lord. If you are a Harry Potter fan... There is an animal within the Harry Potter books called a Thestral. A Thestral is a big, dark horse with wings, except it's generally invisible to most people. Only some people can see them. Harry Potter discovers that he's one of the few people who can see Thestrals when almost all of his classmates, with very few exceptions, cannot see them. As someone explains to Harry, only people who have been touched by death can see them. And he's been touched by death, and that permits him to see what others cannot. Mary Magdalene's past woundedness gives her eyes to see. Mary approached the tomb on Easter morning A woman who knew the scars of pain, isolation, and brokenness. She has, for much of her life, lived a walking death until Jesus came along and healed her. I am convinced that her story was not a hindrance, but the very reason that God chose her to come and see the risen Lord. She was chosen because she was the most likely to be able to see and to understand. Not in spite of her wounds, but because of them. It is Easter morning, and the Lord Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. You and I approach the tomb quietly, 
reverently and with some trepidation. The world around us is a noisy, excited, frenetic place painted with bright pastels, fuzzy bunnies and brightly colored eggs, new Easter dresses, bonnets and Easter baskets all around us. Surely this is the time for happy, whole and joyous people. Yet I approach the tomb keenly aware of my own brokenness. Surely my wounds are not welcome here on this day. But Mary Magdalene's story is a powerful reminder and word to us that Jesus does not call those who are without pain or wounds. Instead, he invites them to be the first to gaze into the tomb. Come, he says to us, approach and see. Bring your uncertainty, bring your wounds, bring your pain. That's why you've been invited to this moment. The tomb is empty. The healing and forgiveness of God has begun. Jesus Christ is risen. Now run. Go tell the world. Amen. Amen.